But it's a very beautiful, complex life with all different kinds of characters. Let's outline the essay now at level one and at level two A. Notice how the essay begins. It begins with a little bit of an introduction where she is living in a foreign land, not in the United States. And she is asked to do something she's never done before. Namely what? Make tortillas, right? Two reasons why she's asked to make tortillas. One, she is a woman. Two, she comes from a culture where everyone assumes she knows how to make tortillas. What is significant about the fact that she doesn't know how to make tortillas? Most Latina girls would know how to make tortillas. Why? Because they are expected to learn it with their mother early on. Right? She says, I didn't really know how to do it. But being asked to do it required of me thinking about my own culture, my own upbringing. This then leads her into thinking about her family. And we want to start on page 160 there. She says, I've managed, last two paragraphs on 160, go there with me now, page 160 at the very bottom. I've managed, she says, to do a lot of things in my life I didn't think I was capable of. Notice the word capable is in blue. That means it's a vocabulary word for us. You might want to jot that word down quickly and just give a working definition. You can probably guess, can't you, from the very definition or the, the very composition of the sentence structure that the word capable means ability to act. In other words, she says, there were a lot of things I didn't think I could do that I learned how to do. She then begins to talk about why she was challenged. Let's write that in our notes at level one. The challenges of her life, right? The first, especially she says, because I'm a woman, a Latina, an only daughter in a family of six men. She will say, this made my life very difficult. Jot down in your notes, I'm going to ask these questions and you just answer them very easily now at level 2A because we're already working towards messages. Question one, why would it be more difficult for a woman than for a man in life? Just write down. See if you have an answer for this one. Why would it be more difficult for a woman than for a man? Number two, why would it be more difficult for a Latino woman than a Latino man? Why would that be more difficult? But I don't understand this last one. Why would growing up in a family of six guys, six men, make her life more difficult. I once had a student who grew up in a family with all of these brothers, and he was Latino, and one sister. And we read this text and we studied it. And he said out loud, you know, I never thought about it, but I can see what she's saying. Because in our culture, the woman, the daughter, the sister, the little girl, she has to obey what the men in her life tell her to do. Bad enough to have one or two brothers, but to have six brothers? Whoa, right? In other words, always somebody telling her what to do, and the expectations are, as she continues, my father would have liked to have seen me married long ago. What? Married? In other words, from the time she is born and grows up in the house, she's told... The number one most important thing you have to do is to get married. Keep reading. She says, in our culture, men and women don't leave their father's house except by way of marriage. I crossed my father's threshold with nothing carrying me but my own two feet. What does that line mean to you? Jot down what that line means. I crossed my father's threshold with nothing carrying me but my own two feet. 
means she didn't get married and carried across the threshold. Rather, she walked out on her own. Whoa, now why would that jot down? Why would that be a challenge? What might she worry about in regards to her father or in regards to her mother? Hmm. Notice she continues, a woman whom no one came for and no one chased away. What do we want to say about a woman like this? Independent? Strong? Courageous? It might take some guts, some courage, to say to a parent, no. Let's jump to 3B really quickly. Have you in your life ever had an experience where you had to say to one of your parents or to somebody in your family who was saying, you're going to do this, and you go, no. Because you felt you were right, and they were wrong. And you said, no. How did, how did that make you feel? Can you write down one time you did that in your life, where you said, no. And you stood up to say, no. Now, of course, when we're very young, this is often considered to be disobedience. But as we get older, now that we are juniors in high school and older, we begin to think about making our own way, making our own life. But the Cisneros essay will point out that you never completely leave, right? You carry with you parts of your family, parts of your life. For example, look on 161. Roughly in that last paragraph, notice she says, from my father. Uh-oh. Now this is interesting. And I just want to jump to 3A for a quick observation. There was a very famous writer many, many years ago in the Roman tradition named Marcus Aurelius. Don't worry about the spelling. Spell it the best way you know how. You can Google the name later. Marcus Aurelius, who wrote a very famous little collection of essay writings called Meditations. I highly recommend this to you. You can read it for free online. He was a very famous leader of the Roman people. And he sat down before he died to write about his life. What do we call that? An autobiography. And the place he began was saying, I want to thank the people in my life who made me who I am. So, for example, he said, from my father, I learned patience. From my uncle, I learned courage. From my mother, I learned, you see what we're saying? Cisneros is going to do something exactly the same, only she doesn't mention at all Marcus Aurelius. But anybody who has read Marcus Aurelius realizes this very line, from my father, I inherited a love of wandering. Let's jot down then at level one the things she took with her when she left. One, first, her father and a love of wandering. Second, page 162, her mother. An amazing woman. Notice her mother when she finally got to a place where she could read from libraries, self-educated, taking care of improving herself. Notice from my brother's Whoa, she learned a lot from growing up with a bunch of guys. Notice her teachers. She was worried about them. Uh-oh, what was her view of school? She says, I didn't do very good in school. Why, because she was stupid, right? No. She says, I didn't think I was stupid. Well, do you think it's true at Worland High School that there are students who are actually very intelligent who actually do poorly in school? Do you think that's possible? I think it is. I think it is. She says, let me tell you why I didn't like school. She says on page 162, second to the last paragraph, when I think how I see myself, it would have to be at age 11. I know I'm 32 on the outside, but inside I'm 11. I'm the girl in the picture with skinny arms, crumpled hair, crooked hair. I didn't like school because they all saw just the outside this. 
where I came from. She says, school was lots of rules. Sitting with your hands folded, being very afraid all the time. One or two readers of this essay have said, Oh, that's how I think of school. The place where I have to come and they do things to me. And I don't like it. And then it turns into a fight. Or I am afraid. And they threaten to do something to me. But notice a lot changes when she gets into her first house. The house she will later refer to as the house on Mango Street. Where she begins to grow. She begins to evolve. Metamorphoses. Change. Ultimately finding her way to Texas. Where? She says she came home and rediscovered much of her heritage. She came back to much of her Mexican roots. So notice in this essay, we begin with tortillas and we end in Texas, talking about a return to the very culture that she left. And in the process, of course, she is understanding how she herself grew. In our final comment, let's go to 3B. What is for you the greatest change you've gone through since you were in high school? Go ahead and jot one down. What is for you the greatest change? Some of us will say it is physical. I have grown up. If you look at a picture of me in eighth grade and you look at a picture of me now, very, very different. Some of you will say, I have changed intellectually. Some of you will say, I have changed my friends, the people who I associated with. Some of you will say, I've changed where I live. I started as an eighth grader somewhere else. Now I'm living here and coming into a new place, like she said, is very difficult to do. How do you fit in? How do you make friends? How do you get along? Some of you will say, I've changed in my relationship in my family, to my mother, to my father, to my brothers, to my sister. Some of you will say, I've changed as a student. And then the final question, how do you think you will change in the next year? Do you have one thing that you want to try to do to change. If we were to ask you, name one thing you want to do to try to change, can you write that one down at 3B? What's one thing you'd like to change in your life? If you could change right now one thing in your life, what would it be? Okay, What would it be for you? Right now, if you could change one thing in your life, just jot down what that would be at 3B. Well, thank you for engaging with us Sandra Cisneros' classic little text. Thank you.